Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Beyond Connection, rural Georgia's premier medical and healthcare professional new media network. This is MedTech Radio. I'm Frank Baia, your host, and today we're greeting Charlie Schiff, Ph.D., Director, Big Data, Healthcare, and Life Sciences at IBM. Charlie, welcome to MedTech. Hi. Thank you very much for inviting me. Charlie, uh, I, to give a sense of perspective of some of the comments that ideally we'll be sharing, let's go back just a little bit prior to IBM. You were with Nokia and Children's Hospital in Boston in various roles in research. That background going into what you're already doing now at uh, IBM, uh, give us a sense of what you've seen happen in the overall healthcare technology over the last uh, several years. Yeah, I think uh, one of the greatest trends is really the digitization of everything. Right? So we're being able to capture so much of what we do. So w- when I was at Nokia, I worked a lot on products that were related around uh, streaming information that's coming off of the mobile device. And uh, we saw uh, that there was a tremendous opportunity to make that much more easy for people to visualize those streams. And because it's a consumer product company, it was more related towards consumer uh, interaction with that data. Mm. And, and that, provide, that was almost a straight line to a lot of the things that I'm doing now um, it, it was like back then we didn't call it big data, but it was the, the, the problem that I was thinking of was like how do we manage and, and, and navigate and recombine all those streams of information that are coming into us and flying out of us. So from 2005 when, we, when really social media started taking off uh, and now in the last couple of years we're, we're having a further digitization of the body through physiological measurements, through EMRs, uh, I think it's a, a really exciting time that, like, how does all that stuff come together, both in, in healthcare for the patient and also for the people who provide care? Well, that's a perfect perspective because what I was really going for, and I think you touched upon it, was at Nokia, at the Children's Hospital, could you have ever foreseen what has happened? I mean, even after from analog to digital, now you've got the hybriding of uh, so many things like cloud and, and apps that are, um, seemingly, we used to cliche and say change was the only consistent. And I think there is no such thing as disruptive anymore. There's just constant, constant change, constant evolution. Um, kind of a, a sense of um, how are you seeing the future from where you're standing today? Has your mind opened up even bigger than it was back at the days of Nokia and Children's Hospital? In yeah, terms I, I of what's possible? I, I, the way I view it is uh, I don't think we ever know how it's going to look when you get there to the future. But I think because we're always trying to find a way to solve a problem, we know what needs to be solved in the future. And I, that's how it's always been for me. I, I, I truly believe that humans are tool makers. We're, you know, from the prehistoric days, we were always like, hey, we can fix it with, you know, insert new technology or insert new process or insert new way of thinking. And I think we... We always do the same similar set of things, but each round it's a different set of tools. It's a new way of thinking um, to solve certain core problems around, like, communication, around transport, around energy. You know, they're very core, but every round we're doing something different. So we don't know what it's going to look like. I think no one, no one, no one could predict the web. But I think a lot of people realize, hey, we've got this Internet thing. You know, we've got these uh, networks that we're connecting to. What if we connected them this way? And then all of a sudden everything changes, right? So I think um, the same thing with social media. I mean, nobody really expected that, but that was not so different than what we already had. Well, pattern really detection. Now we're talking pattern detection. Now we're talking about being able to structure big data to such an extent that you can anticipate and uh, deal with, the, I guess, deductive reasoning before the question even comes up. I think, you know, what's really kind of interesting, I, I really agree with you a thousand percent over the fact, I, I've said just recently um, that history is really all about change. You know, the past is really about the acceptance of change, and, and probably the best way to get into the future is to have it come through the past. And I know that sounds like a little esoteric, but part, part of the, what you, I'm sure, challenged with at IBM is not only the capability to do these things, but the cultural acceptance to be able to have them be adopted in the various environments, like, for example, the one that we're most interested in, the rural marketplace. Would you agree that part of the challenge is uh, getting the adoption of some of these new uh, digital capabilities? Absolutely. So we did a, a survey uh, a year or two ago 
uh, where we were at. I, I think I'm big data, but really for me it's about analytics, about analyzing that data and gaining those insights. And so mm -hmm. everything I think about is analytics. So we did some research, uh, a survey, IBM did a survey a few years back about um, what are the barriers to analytics in an organization. And, you know, we had all these different things that people came up with. The first one, getting the data, we're like, okay, so the next five were all organizational. Do you have a champion for analytics? Do you have a culture of sharing data? Do you even know what to do when you get the insight, right? Mm -hmm. That's a skill level, right? So, so yes, that's a huge amount. And we, when we talk to people, two things always pop up that, um, that, that tell me that we're in an organizational issue. The first one is they go, oh, what's new? Right? So these people are, are they, because it's not that it's not new, but the things have become much more mature, both in our thinking and in our, in our uh, technology. And then the second thing is, uh, lots of times people say, I get it, but how do I get my boss to get it? Mm -hmm. right? and, and so that's a great question. That's not a question of, I need to prove an ROI or I need to prove a TCO, you know, all those buzzwords for business. It really is, how do I tell my boss that if she bets on this, He's going to look great. She's going to look awesome, right? It's really just a, a social, cultural kind of thing within an organization. And, and you know, we were talking before we got on here about the, your audience. That it, you know, it's a whole range of people. And I think we're going to have people who are going to be saying, okay, you come to me every two years with a new buzzword, right? How is that any different? How is it going to make it better for me? Why do I need to pay attention to this? And so I think you know, to get to that next step, of people adopting and, and really taking full use of these tools, mm -hmm. uh, we need to make their mind. We need to make them understand how it fits in their cultural setting and their social setting. Well, Eastern okay. philosophers say that the solution is simple. It's the implementation that's hard. And, and I think you could, if you want to draw a, a challenge, not only do you have to deal in a, in a private sector environment, think of it as it relates to the public sector in terms of getting adoption of even infrastructure like the broadband um, situation as far as uh, the uh, uh, stimulus package is concerned and some of the outreach into the rural markets because unless the political leadership, the regional planning authorities have enough vision to understand what they're getting into or not getting into, it's all about change. And unfortunately, and it's not necessarily a judgment, it's just a reality about I think the way a lot of us feel and think is that I'd rather stay safe than change. So inevitably, they potentially close the door. And I think the point you're making, and I hopefully I'm reinforcing, is that um, it's not about how things work. It's what they do. So, you know, instead of maybe focusing on the mechanics of some of the analytics and how you go about getting those analytics, it's actually probably better. And this is the next question that I've got in my mind, is that how do, how do analytics, can you, how can you tap into that information uh, and from, say, other larger hospitals and larger caseloads and then actually improve diagnosis and treatment decisions. You know, how is that going to actually – tell me how analytics is going to make a difference uh, in terms of a rural outreach in a particular market in, in uh, North Georgia. Right, right. And, and, and uh, I've been thinking hard about that. We do, we do think about these things um, that, you know, we don't like to talk about the technology. Like you said, the solution – we'll figure out that solution. It's really understanding what we want to do with it. And so when we think of these things, we say, okay – how can, you know, where are we start for insight? Where can data help us understand something in a system or a, a population? And, and the problem is, this is the challenge I think I feel with a lot of rules, anything that's not out of sight of a large metropolis, right, is density. And I think density is a challenge. And, and with data, you know, the, the thing is why the large hospitals in the big cities are able to do population health management is that they have hundreds of thousands of patients, tens of thousands of patients who are coming through their single point of uh, contact into one system, and they're able to manage a lot of the aspects of the care. Hmm. You know, if you look at a rural setting, it's a completely different sure. uh, story, right? It's probably, you know, wow. I, I'm, I'm guessing here, but most of the care is probably built by a primary physician who doesn't have a huge caseload, right, seeing mostly family care, and then having to refer the person to a secondary um, uh, institution when they don't know what's going on, right? Ideally, if we're using our data properly and really understanding what our population is, say, across the state, we can push that information out to those doctors so those doctors have 
let's say, a prosthetic that helps them think better. I, I use that term. That, that they have access to that data to understand that patient that they have, even though they don't have all that data. Well, they, take, their patient can be compared to other places. You know, it's a simple thing that you just said to you, I'm sure, but the reality is an epiphany. I mean, obviously, exactly the situation as it relates to, you know, probably one of the biggest challenges that in, in I think most rural outreaches is the problem of patient versus doctor, and is there enough patients to generate doctor? Is there enough doctor um, to service the patient? And what comes first? Because you've got a lot of situations where there actually were medical facilities that are leaving because they simply didn't have the population to support it. And it's I, not just that. It's not just that. It's, it's, actually, it's actually, does the doctor have enough patients to have seen all possibilities of health care, right? So my, my wife's a veterinarian, and we always talk about the, you know, the caseload, right? So I, I used to, when I was working at Children's, I, these doctors were seeing every case. They knew everything, and what we what we see happen sometimes is that a doctor in a in a non city setting missing a diagnosis and delaying the treatment because they just didn't know or they just weren't sure. Whereas, of course, a doctor that's in the hospital, like Children's, is seeing so many cases of this that it's mm -hmm. like, oh, that was obvious, but it wasn't obvious to the doctor out there. I and mean, we should fault those doctors. You know, it's just they don't. Ha you know, it's so much of medicine is experience, right? And if you're not getting the experience of seeing those cases over and over again, you're not going to get it. So how do we get that data out there so that they can take advantage of that larger set of understanding? Okay, so from, a, from, a, a, from an amateur's perspective, let's see if I'm understanding, and that is what you're saying is analytics can be used to better understand, say, something like uh, epidemiology around some specific challenges of a rural population like obesity where that doctor may not have enough patients or enough volume to make any kind of pre-diagnosis or determination based on the general law population because they just don't have enough patients to see the problem. So sharing the analytics or getting involved in big data from that standpoint is actually allowing you to be part of the greater knowledge so that you can help the individual. Yes, and I think this is a place where the state can really uh, tap into. Uh, and, I mean, at some level here, at least in the Northeast, uh, we see a lot of the hospitals uh, extending their tendrils to regional hospitals, right, where now they're starting to become huge networks where they can share that data. And so you're not really part of the main hospital, but you get access to that understanding and, those ex and that expertise uh, and the connection with a, a much larger setup, right, that has better data. So therefore, when a patient comes in presenting certain situations that might be novel to the doctor, or the doctor might say, look, I would do this, but then say, okay, patients like this patient, let's go figure out in, in our region or in our state, patients like this, how do they interact with the social system, how do they interact with the healthcare system so that we can provide the best care. An individual doctor out in the rural place will probably not have that full, unless they're really, I mean, I can't make a judgment call there, but you know, will they have all those tools to be able to make that decision that a hospital in, in, in the main cities can do because they have that population base? So how do we push that data out there? Mm -hmm. And I think either the hospitals are going to have to reach out to these rural, you know, to have a rural program where they reach out and share this data with them, or the government's going to have to say, look, we're going to pool all the data across the state. Um, I was in an event yesterday. Uh, so I live in the state of Massachusetts, so it was one of, it's the first state to – really pull together all the healthcare into a state level kind of view. And they're collecting all that data on what patients are doing. Now they're saying, okay, we have all this data. How can we give everyone in the state the ability to understand what everyone in the state is doing so that all of us can provide better care, right? And so the government is really taking an active role understanding that and, and, and pushing that. And I think that's what it's, I don't think, I don't, I'm not saying that's the answer, but that's one way. I mean, really what the answer is, is like, how does that data get shared? How does that insight get shared? And I think that's going to be the challenge for that single doctor out in a rural setting who, who, who might not have it, right? You know, as, as crazy as this is going to sound coming from my side, of you know, we often say everything's the same, only different. And the reality of a lot of the things that you're uncovering, a lot of the information that you're talking about gathering from a pure healthcare vertical is really the same thing that's going on with analytics across the board in almost every other vertical. It could be fintech or logistics. and. You know, you sometimes from a private public perspective, you know, that debate of the redundancy and duplication when isn't there 
maybe it's a little bit Pollyannic, a, a time when we can all get along and avoid the duplication and literally work together. I know from a broadband initiative perspective, they're doing asset management and trying to gather up uh, knowledge of served and underserved. And I would wonder that there wouldn't be a correlation between gathering some healthcare information at the same time they were gathering, um, you know, infrastructure information. Unfortunately, we're, we're quickly running out of time, Charlie, and, and I don't mean to cut you off because I'd love to spend, a, a, if you would allow us, a, a, an hour talking, maybe a couple of hours because there's so much great inf information. Um, hopefully, you'll allow us an, another opportunity to chat again sometime in the future. But before I go, I've got to ask you the question, after everything that we're talking about 10 years from now, um, Dr. Watson? Uh, yeah, so so if, you know, the one bit I wanted to leave before we go, is, is and it ties to Watson, is the whole concept of telemedicine. And to me, I think, I, so I can't, being at Nokia, we thought mobile all along. And to me, the, the power of mobility is actually pushing the intelligence to the edge rather than making access to the center. And I think in the computer world, we very much think of access to the center. And I believe that telemedicine is very much a discussion of getting access to the center, that the experts are somewhere in some gilded hall, and uh, they make, you know, we ask them the questions and they provide the answers. I think where I see something like a Watson, you know, and if you do a Google search for Zach Kohane, K-O-H-A-N-E, he has a great little article on how Watson can actually transform the way we do medicine in the sense of pushing that intelligence uh, across the care network, right? So that to free up the doctors to do it. And we're not saying that Watson really replaces the doctor, but it really provides that ability to ask questions um, that you couldn't ask before because you just couldn't keep up with certain things. And, I don't know what you guys um, professionally call it, but I think it, it's going to be up to the individual patient, self-directed. You'll be the doctor. I mean, it's a case of you may yeah, be I don't, I don't know if we'll go that far. I, I still think there's going to be a, a role for, just like there's a role for editors in publishing, there's going to be a role for doctors and caregivers, nurse practitioners in, in the giving of the care. I think, I think that always, definitely in 10 years, probably even in a hundred. And uh, I think, you know, if we flip the telemedicine on its head, I think that Watson thinking of pushing the question, the answers out to the edge of, instead of giving it, you know, having the experts be in the center, pushing it to the edge, I think it's going to be really powerful. And yes, I think it's going to be a mixture of empowered patients, a mixture of empowered nurses, right? And a mixture of doctors who are going to be able to have an ally to, to help them provide the care where they want to provide the care in the environment they want to provide the care rather than having to always send people to, to the city. And I think where, where this is going to go is that uh, we're going to do more stuff outside the hospital. We're going to do more stuff in the clinic away from the major hospital. Uh, and the major hospitals are going to be focusing on just those really hard things. Uh, and that's where I see it going, and that's where I, I would like to see it going. And I think... Something like Watson plays into that. I mean, good, good, it, good stuff, Charlie. Really good stuff. I'm, I may steal that pushing information to the edge and, uh, instead of access to the center because I, I like simple, understandable logic. And man, that ever that nails it. Maybe that's some mantra or something out of IBM or a personal passion on your part. But I'm, I think that's really good stuff. Hey, Charlie, uh, I know you're a busy guy, and I cannot thank you enough for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us for at least a few minutes here on on MedTech, and, and again, an open invitation to join us anytime that you have the opportunity. Thank you for the opportunity.